Hello, 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 hello. So give me a shout out if you all can see my screen here and hear my voice, all of you out there in internet land. So welcome back to another uh, Pixelogic stream here. Today we have a pretty special stream. So this will not be my normal kind of ZBrush live stream going through here. So we're gonna be doing this uh, series that we've collaborated with uh, Proco on. And so this will be the first of three streams that we're gonna be doing on this topic, at least for my stuff here. Now, Paul will be back um, tomorrow doing some stuff on Saturday, and then Solomon and Daisuke will also be on too. But for my next three streams, including this one, we're gonna be focusing on this collaboration uh, with us here at Pixelogic and Proco. Now, Proco is a online art resource that contains amazing art uh, tutorials and they're also very entertaining. Now we've teamed up with uh, Scott Flanders and uh, or Shape Carver as he's known online and we're gonna work on this process of kind of simulating the character concept from taking from like a 2D concept to a 3D concept um, and follow that kind of process. And so this is gonna hit more on my kind of thinking process and bounce off of some of the ideas that Scott uh, does as well when he's doing the 2D side of things. So hopefully it'll be an informative uh, little session here and we'll show you some ZBrush usage as well to kind of get you uh, established. Now I'm gonna put the link to uh, Proko's uh, video here that he's already got up. So Scott's already got his first video up where he goes through his kind of conceptual design uh, covering the uh, collaboration we're doing with them. So I'm gonna paste that quickly in the chat here. And if you guys have not seen it, I definitely recommend checking it out. Also, I'm going to put the uh, link here to this page I have on. So this is our calendar site here on the Pixelogic uh, ZBrush Live uh, page here. And here you'll be able to get reminders and different things set up. So if you have a stream you wanna follow, you can be reminded uh, through various forms and get the information you're kind of looking for. So this is just the one here on the collaboration. So we have some uh, brief information on this. So we're collaborating with myself and Scott Flanders and then Proco. And it just kind of summarizes the process we're gonna do here. And then here's a link also as well to the first part of the video. And then in addition to this, we'll be going for three streams. This is part one, which is Friday, May 8th. And then we'll be following up on May 13th and also the May 20th. So there'll be our three different ones there. And then if you guys are looking for more information on Proco, we have some links down here as well to them. So once again, if you're doing anything with art, uh, the tutorials and training on Proco's uh, YouTube channel is, is amazing. So I definitely go check it out because if you're a ZBrush artist already, his stuff will help you kind of establish or become a better artist. And if you've never uh, used ZBrush before and this is your first time even hearing about the application, thank you for coming out to the stream today. Now, if you are coming from Proco side of things and you may not have heard of ZBrush before, so ZBrush is the uh, award-winning digital sculpting application. And basically the principle of ZBrush is that it will allow you to sculpt on a computer um, as you would in clay, so, but you're doing it digitally. So you have things like undo, symmetry, and you can push and pull your model and kind of get that realistic feeling of working with clay, but you're not getting your hands dirty. If you have arthritis, it's a, it's a great um, solution to be able to let you create art in kind of a clay format. Now with this, we're used in a whole bunch of different industries. So we're using film, game, jewelry, automotive, illustration, advertising, archeology, span and even the medical fields. And so we're using a lot of places. So if you've seen a video a game or played a video game recently or seen a movie, um, more than likely if any of the characters are digital or CG, they probably end up having some part of their process in their creation inside of ZBrush. Now we also offer a way you can try out the software for free. So if you're coming from Proco's side of stuff and you want to give ZBrush a spin, we have a 30 day free trial which has no uh, restrictions. So you can basically get the full version of ZBrush here, the professional version, and for 30 days you can try all the different processes in there. Now here at Pixelogic we've been doing these kind of daily developer streams and some of them are focused on more like follow alongs. So I've been doing series called uh, Z Classroom Live which you can see here, I did not update the banner down here. So <laughs> you guys are just gonna get more information on that. And with this, um, I usually go through and I'll probably start, I start usually as a basic, like this is you just launched ZBrush for the first time with the trial, and then I'll go through the processes in there. And there's a bunch of different stuff inside of ZBrush, but at the basis, the sculpting side can be very simplistic. And once you get a grasp of it, you'll really feel the power of the software itself and then just go nuts. So there's a lot of power in it. 
Um, also with this, we have um, another thing with our software too, is that it's not graphic card dependent. So what this means is that if you have a computer, um, it's just gonna use your computer's processor itself. It's not gonna use the graphics card. So this is good, especially if you have, um, you know, people during this time right now, they're looking for stuff to do, um, maybe wanna expand their learning or their knowledge. You don't need a supercomputer to run ZBrush. Now having a powerful computer does help in speeding up some of the processes, but I have a uh, Core 2 Duo machine from 14 years ago, 14 years ago that I um, will do like support testing on with, and I can still launch the latest version of ZBrush and it runs perfectly fine. So one thing there with that, and with the trial, we have it available for uh, Macintosh and also Windows. So two things there with that. Now in terms of learning uh, ZBrush, there's a whole bunch of avenues we have online. Uh, our YouTube channel is filled with different things. We have a bunch of live streamers that stream daily on our ZBrush live channel, and you can go and watch them. And during that time, it is a live stream. So if you have any questions about what they're doing, you can definitely type in and ask them. Um, in addition to this, we also have a portal which is called Z Classroom. And in here, we have a whole bunch of different tutorials and training that are just focused around ZBrush and digital sculpting. So there's a bunch of different uh, things in there you can watch and learn from. We also have a whole series on YouTube, our YouTube channel that is called Ask ZBrush. And so basically I go through on a weekly basis and I try to answer questions that have been submitted on Twitch. And then if I can answer these questions um, in like under a 10 minute video, I think a few of these videos are over that time period, um, we go through and try to answer those. So this is a great way if you come across something inside of ZBrush or maybe you're stumped, you can just go to YouTube and type Ask ZBrush and kind of hit the keywords of what you're looking to do. And more than likely there's gonna be a video that's already there which you can play and get a solution to your issue. And then in addition to that, we also have um, a support site as well that you can go to and access uh, support. And if you come across anything that you think might be a bug um, or just various workflow issues, we're often able to point you in the right direction on that. So with the project here, if you guys turned into uh, Scott's stuff, um, Scott created this excellent kind of concept for us here. And I'm just gonna pull that up here quick. Here, let's first hit, hit the Scott video. So this is the link again, I'm gonna put it in chat one more time here. Watch we get, let's get my hyperlinks going here. We gotta we got get this sorted out. So here's a link to the first video in this kind of series. So this is on the Proco side here. And here we have Scott um, sitting here in front of this massive Cintiq and he's just kind of doing his stuff here. So definitely go and check this video out. It's gonna give you the pre format or the pre-instructional stuff to what I'm about to stream on. So if you haven't watched it yet, definitely check it out and definitely check out the rest of Proco's um, site there. And so that's just Proco. Let me get my video over there. So there's Stan, Stan right there. And that's the Proco. And then um, here we have Scott doing his concept stuff. All right, so with this chat too, I'm gonna try to answer questions, but if it's off topic or something that, you know, I normally would answer in some of my other streams, I may not be able to get it today because I really wanna focus on kind of this project itself. So just one little thing there of note. And we have a lot of people in the chat, so definitely if you are a ZBrush user and we have um, people in here that are from, say, the Proco side, please, by all means, if you guys can help out and answer questions for people, it'd be uh, really appreciative on my side. And yes, my hairstyle is, uh, this is the someday I'll get it cut. Uh, so, <laughs> and eventually, so right now I've got my, as Paul was saying the other day in one of his streams, my uh, Beatles style haircut here. All right, so now into the nitty gritty of the process here. So here I have the uh, images here that we got from uh, uh, Scott here on his side. So here we have Scott's concept arts. And so the main principle is how I'm gonna, we're going about this collaboration is that it's not gonna be your cut and dry kind of outsourced kind of concept process. So with outsourcing, you'd probably get concept art that would be fully fleshed out, right? You get front, back, side view, you'd get things that are calling out different things. And then as a 3D artist, you expected to model this exactly how this concept art is because the concept is established, it's checked off, and now you wanna have it finalized and have a result that's fully fleshed out that matches it. So the process in our collaboration here, one of the things that when we start working on this, I wanted Scott to just generate a, a rough version of the concept. So I didn't want turnarounds and anything like that. Because the main thing on this is that the simulation that we're kind of trying to demonstrate is the conceptual process from the 2D art to a conceptual 3D model that would be used in say IP development. 
So in a company, you'd have, say, Scott, and then myself, and then usually an art director, and we'd be all in the same kind of room here. And so the art director would come down the pipe and he'd be like, hey, I've got this idea. We need some visuals to go along with it. So the idea behind the project here is Pixel Rangers. And so the Pixel Rangers are a series, a team of characters that um, deal with pixels. Now the pixel itself is part of ZBrush. So ZBrush has this pixel tech technology and basically it deals with X and Y position values and color, and then it also adds depth into it. So it's X and Y plus depth. And so that is what the pixel is. And it's one of the proprietary sculpting technologies that is inside of ZBrush. So these are the pixel rangers. Now with the, uh, the concept here, so the idea is that, you know, we flesh something out and then during this pipeline of the production, after it's fleshed out to a certain point, it, I would work with Scott in tandem. So I'd say, hey, you know, that's awesome. Let me see if I can get a 3D mock-up of it. And we'd work through on the mock-up on that. And then along the way, we change different things. So Scott's also a veteran of the game industry. So this is kind of a common practice. And this will happen especially in kind of small teams and also just things with IP development, which is usually just little stylized groups of people that go in, they're honed together just because their skill sets are allow them to create things fast, generate ideas quickly, and then they can get them distributed outwards to the people that control the money and say yay or nay to a project. So it's a very uh, kind of common approach to creating art. And with this, you can also have just, you know, nowadays, you used to just, or back in the day, you used to just have the 2D art. And you'd show the 2D art and that'd be enough for a sign off. But nowadays, what it gets to is you have the 2D art, but then we want, we can also generate a 3D asset using ZBrush. And this will give you us another view to that model. And then, so if you go in, say the art director goes in to pitch the project, he has 2D back, background, he has 2D images, and he has a 3D model. And oftentimes even this 3D model can be taken in and printed out, and then that's laying on the conference room table in there. So now when he's pitching the project or the idea of the Pixel Rangers here, he has 2D images and he has a 3D model that's on the table to catch the investor's eyes, can fetch the higher ups, you know, hey, oh, this is awesome, let's, let's go forth and uh, continue this project. So <clears throat> with this here, the uh, main thing here that kind of Scott was going off, uh, with his kind of creation of the Pixel Rangers, his initial pass, was of their team, right? So we have a very collaborative team here, and you can see some of the things in here, like the Z-Sphere technician. Z-Spheres are a process inside of ZBrush. So he's kind of honed in on those different elements um, and kind of getting those kind of flushed out and playing with the styles of, you know, playing with the wordage for ZBrush and kind of the Pixel technology. Now with this, Scott hits on a lot, you know, having this kind of naming convention. So he's gone through and named the characters, which gives them personality and gives them life. So it takes them from those just static images and has them like alive now, like Scott will hit on in his uh, video if you guys watch it, you know, and this is a very common thing, but if you give something a name, it has a personality. And that's a big part of kind of designing through this. Now with the uh, Pixel Rangers here, the one I'll be focusing on is this guy right here. And Scott's named him Compression Hammer and Rig. And so with this, it's kind of a buddy dynamic or a buddy trope. So we have, you know, things in current art or the uh, movies and stuff. You have like Rocket and Groot, like that's kind of the similar thing. You also have Master Blaster. Um, so these kind of elements where you have this one character and then he has a little buddy that goes along with it. And so that we can see here uh, in his concept. So we have the main guy that's kind of this big bulky guy. Uh, Scott's, you know, gone through and said, you know, he, it's, he's kind of got this, um, bear, grizzly, bison kind of shoulder thing going around. And a lot of this also goes into form and function too. So with this character, he's going to be more kind of uh, triangulated, right? So he's going to have this kind of dynamic, let me get a larger brush size here, that ends up feeding into this kind of style. Like it's definitely more of a triangle. So broad shoulders and then cuts in. And oftentimes when you're designing stuff too, or even doing 3D concepts, you'll break things down into you know, different shapes. And this just allows you to expand your form. So you have one character that maybe fits this triangle shape, you have another one that fits a square shape, and then you have another one that fits a circle. And this kind of element allows you to differentiate the different types of that team that are gonna be being built. So another little design thing through there. So with this, um, we're talking about you know, the kid element, you know, Lone Wolf and Cub, Rock and a Goot, Groot, uh, Master Blaster. And then in addition to this, uh, let's say that 
this was the concept. The art director has now seen it. And there's a few things he hits on that he wants to stay. So I'm going to do a pass on this because I want to flesh out some other stuff, maybe bring in some more elements to it using my skill set. But then there's a few things in here that the art director's like, I really like that. Let's keep that part. And so with this, um, the main things in here that the, say, the art director here in our simulation wants to keep is he definitely wants the buddy thing. He definitely wants, you know, the Rocket and Groot, the, the Master Blaster dynamic. So, you know, this little guy here is definitely, you know, needs to come along with the, uh, the model here. We also, he really likes this kind of mask thing, right? So he has this mask that's very, like, uh, dark and kind of, like, uh, shiny to kind of like element that kind of unity across all the uh, characters that uh, Scott's mocked up and if we come over and look at this you can see that's kind of a unifying element across this team this kind of face shield so that's another thing the art director is like hey I want to keep that uh, third thing with this guy is definitely these uh, tentacles so you kind of got this uh, Davy Jones kind of effect going on here and that's another thing that's hey this is an iconic part of this character I really like it you must keep that in your build. And then finally, the other one is the uh, compression hammer. So some sort of weapon that's big, bulky, powerful, and has some sort of like oozing light elements out of it. So another element that really needs to stay coherent with this character to make this compression and rig model here. So <clears throat> if you're just tuning in, this is uh, a little collaboration project we're doing with uh, Proco and us here, at, myself here at Pixelogic. And so we're going through and we're generating a 3D concept from the 2D concept that Scott created. And we're kind of working it in a IP sense. So let's say as, you know, in the game industry, we'd often have teams that would be just broken off to deliver a new IP or a new development process. So there was an idea brought up and they now need some art to kind of convey this idea. And so in these teams, we'd often have a concept artist like Scott, and then you have a modeler like myself, and then we usually have an art director. And we kind of work in this kind of collaborative process back and forth to try to build the characters out and make them as strong as possible. So then when this IP gets pitched, to the uh, powers that be, they'll end up signing off on it and green light the project as a go. So <clears throat> that is the initial thing here, just on kind of those things. I have some more notes that we'll be talking on here as we keep going on. Um, because definitely, you know, there will be some happy accidents as I work these things. And I have a kind of an end goal I want to reach today. And over these period of three streams, hopefully by the end of it on the third one, we'll have a final finished asset out of it. Now, another quick thing I want to hit on before we just go into uh, ZBrush here, there we have Scott, is that I'll often, uh, before I start any kind of projects like this, I'll go through and I have like a bunch of books uh, in my studio. I have just like a large bookshelves that kind of expand across the room and it's all art books. And what I'll do, my process to kind of when I start modeling stuff from, you know, specific thing of concept art to add to it, to add like different elements to it, is I'll start filling my head with as much information, information and inspiration that I can. Now I know some people like to work in kind of isolation where they'll try to not like see anything for a long time and come up with like fully uh, new ideas. Um, I like to work kind of the opposite. I like to saturate my head with enough stuff where when I think about things I can get the cool elements out of it and kind of go through the things that have interesting shapes and designs that I like. So <clears throat> with this, um, I often go through on just the internet and I'll just grab a bunch of different stuff. And so an example of this, um, when I first saw this uh, glass helmet here, uh, I really keyed into some things I've seen, you know, in uh, Star Wars stuff, and one of them is the Sentinel, right? So this is one of the, like, I, when I first saw this, I was like, wow, that, that's, that's awesome. And so this would be a thing that I'd cue in on, and it's definitely one of the things that I'd like to flush out or explore more. Now, these images that I pull up, they'll never be copied, so I'm not going to go through and look at these as reference. This is just an example of how I kind of will go through and just kind of find a library of images and just fill my brain with them. And then as I'm working, um, I can kind of design that out a little bit more. So they're not going to be used as like a direct reference, they're more just inspiration in terms of things. Now, with the Pixel Rangers themselves, um, with compression here, the one thing with the Pixel is it deals with depth. So the initial ideas we had here was, it was uh, tech warriors that basically deal with this Pixel technology. Now, as I'm thinking on this, um, I'm going in, what is the main thing that this could be done? Like, what, like if this person is in an environment, where are they at? And the main element that I kept going to while uh, thinking on this is that the Pixel deals with depth. Right, so it's red and green color, and then it has the Z value with its depth. So where does depth exist? 
Now, if you think about like the guy could potentially be in space, but the issue with space is, is the vacuum. You're not dealing with kind of the pressure in terms of depth. So when I went into like researching, kind of filling my brain with stuff, I came through and I wanted to find elements that contain this depth. So underwater type aspects. And you can see this kind of um, Davy Jones kind of effect that Scott added to him definitely plays in that part as well. Um, so pulling in on that idea and combining it into a depth kind of thing. So these would end up being, you know, things like this, like stuff that contains compression. And so a lot of these kind of images that I've kind of pulled has these different kind of things like what makes a device or a piece of armor or a character like able to withstand that pressure. And so just using these as kind of like a idea for shape language, uh, we'll go through and just kind of let me get these kind of ideas in my head. So definitely looking at underwater vehicles, submersibles. Uh, these are some worker kind of uh, devices that for offshore drilling, so things like that. Uh, we also have, say, you know, pressure tanks or uh, decompression chambers. So things that are kind of bulky. And so some of these elements here could play into the compression hammer, right? So there's a lot of different visual design aspects in these kind of images where you have these round things that are able to contain that pressure. This could be a main element that could be put into into the uh, compression hammer that the, that the character here has. Also, in terms of this, um, often we'll you know, kind of go into different things as well. So a pose, right, is another thing that's kind of hit on. So I have some reference images for kind of things like that. Um, when I was thinking about this guy originally, you know, having that V shape, I'm thinking like a lot of Potemkin from Guilty Gear, right? So it's a big, massive guy. Um, and then something like a pose like this, often like we'll run around and do like different dynamic stuff. Um, to kind of get the feel for it, but I want to be bulky and kind of hunkered down. So this is one of the some of the poses I keyed into there. Uh, you can see I have some images here also with say that the tentacle aspect. So we have like Nautiluses, we have that Davy Jones, uh, Octopus is another play on this, and then even Cthulhu, right? So kind of things like this that could you know elements or bring out you know more of the information on that. Uh, talking back into the depth stuff too, another thing that you know just kind of thinking even ahead as I'm, before I even start sculpting on anything, thinking about, you know, the tactile forms or the surface nature of the uh, armor or the clothing the character's wearing. So this guy deals with death, he's a big guy. And so we have like these different things from life that I can relate to or pull from, which will help bring believability into the character and help bring a connection that someone can hit on. So like, this is reality right here, right? So we have these kind of MIG, uh, compression suits for high speed flying, right? So these things have some really interesting things. So just the idea of say like the suit that expands and contracts is an interesting element, right? So you're dealing with pressure, right? This depth, this pixel depth for these warriors. So kind of bringing in maybe something like this onto say the tactical clothing of this character uh, to kind of show that, hey, his, his clothing can expand or maybe he expands himself. Um, in addition to this, we just have some like different, you know, astronauts and stuff that have some, you know, different pressure kind of valves. So Scott in his original image has like these hoses and stuff too. So just trying to think like how I can take those hoses and say ground them into reality, right? So I don't really want to have anything on the character that doesn't really feel like it has a purpose. Um, so even though it's a fictional character, I want to still have some believability into it. So I want it to be, even if it's a fictional believability, I want that process in there. I don't just want to have a hose sticking out of his hand for no reason. I want to have some sort of um, continuity with life in there. Uh, finally, we'll also look up, you know, just the word compression hammer has a whole bunch of different uh, connotations too. These are just some examples of compression hammers. Uh, so different things, jackhammers is another thing. So different elements in here, like these things exist in the real world. So just pulling, saying style and form from those a little bit to kind of get it uh, going. And then finally, with the compression hammer too, these are some just other images of just the weight of it. Like it's it's a big device, right? And as say he's using it. You know, you want that mass, you want that feel from this character as he's using this compression hammer and he has his little buddy on his back, right? So that's kind of like bulk or weight to this device as well. And these are just some uh, various model kits and some additional uh, concept art that's been created online that um, just had some interesting kind of vibes to it that I liked. So just that mass and kind of feel is one thing I want to hit on too. And then here we have the 
the final thing there. And another thing, just checking out like Scott's stuff too, like even following the process often helps me uh, kind of flesh things out as well. So this was one of his initial kind of uh, revisions of uh, compression and uh, compression hammer and rig there. And so you can see like he has this like wide sloping shoulder. So just even getting like hints of that kind of stuff also helps me like get ideas in my mind on how to flesh his concept out a little bit more. So that's a little design <laughs> methodology there as I go into like a process like this. Um, let's see if I have any questions here. So hopefully my mic, it seems like my mic was hitting stuff. So my art station is just, uh, I think it's just piggysonartstation.com. Um, we can, someone can probably find a link there for you guys. All right, so now that we covered kind of the basics and the elements and we had um, Scott's in there, I mean, I'm gonna keep this image from Scott up here. So I'm just gonna resize uh, this here quick. And this is actually a uh, application here called uh, Pure Ref. So it's just a really nice thing. It works really well with ZBrush and I can lock it and then also set it to be always on top. So I'll end up living here as I work inside of ZBrush here. And I'm gonna move this out of the way just a little bit here if I can get my, my buttons clicking, my button clickings. And we'll put this say here, checking this on the stream here. And yeah, with this, you know, I wanna make sure that I hit those elements that the you know, design director wanted um, or the art director. So, I want to elaborate on what Scott has. So this isn't going to be a full, you know, let's make exactly what it is because that's not the purpose of this. Like this is, we have one image and now I'm going in and helping define it. And then in a, you know, a standard scenario, I'd send it back to Scott. Scott would do paint overs on it. We'd modify changes again. And we just go back and forth this way until we're both happy with it and the art director's happy with it. And that kind of collaboration makes stuff a lot stronger. Um, because you just have that ability to, you know, get two minds or a team of people kind of working at a certain goal and you're both on the project, you have this passion, you know, harness that passion and get them to uh, generate the best results possible. So for the question here about the um, references, so oftentimes I'll just keep them. I have multiple monitors usually and I'll have them on another monitor. Uh, for this stream here, you guys can really see one of my monitors, so I'm going to leave it right here. Um, and we're gonna go along with that. Now, this is ZBrush, and so ZBrush is a digital sculpting application. And the main thing here is that there's a lot of processes. I cover the basics of this kind of in my other kind of streams. But for this one here, I'm trying not gonna go into full tutorial mode <laughs> with you all, but I wanna show some of the power of the software and how to go and use the different things here. So here I just have a digital ball of clay. And one thing I'll do in here is when I'm definitely starting a project like this, uh, oftentimes I may already have a base mesh that's blocked out. And so I do have one that I've kind of started already that I'll get to, uh, that I'll use eventually. But for this, I just want to show you the power of just creation. And in ZBrush, I can just take something as simple as the sphere and start pulling shapes out and generating my overall forms. So with my uh, compression hammer and rig here, this Pixel Ranger, you know, I want to establish his base silhouette. Uh, inside ZBrush, we also have this little window here that is a silhouette kind of view. So as we're using stuff in here, if you see if I come through and say start moving this or pulling some forms out, you'll see it's going to update up here. And this is handy because it gives me a different view to my model. So Scott, when he was going through his things, he's talking a lot about the shape and the silhouette and design. And that's definitely still something that I want to contain and keep as I'm working on the model. And so as I'm pulling things out, I want to be able to see that surface through there. Now the process I'm using now is a, uh, just manipulating this clay through here, this digital clay. And I have this mode called Sculptress turned on. And what Sculptress allows me to do is I can start pulling and pushing these forms and it's going to just add topology where it's needed. So I can quickly come through and start blocking out different designs here. And so you can see in a few seconds here, I already have something that's starting to fill in and look at the information, right? And this is just one brush, so I'm not really doing anything, you know, elaborate. I'm just looking at the forms. I'm using this reference up here in the silhouette view to just kind of like see it there. And then I have Scott's image as well. And with this, I can start pulling out, you know, different elements such as legs here. Oops, we, uh, we might have uh, went crazy there. And then I can inflate different parts. Oh, let me get my, my hotkeys here going crazy today. 
And this way you can actually come through and start refining these forms. We also have a process that's called um, DynaMesh inside here, which will remesh an entire model. And that's another kind of helpful process that will allow you to come through and just start pulling out shapes. Now, most of the times when I'm doing this kind of process here, I'm playing with the forms, playing with the silhouette. None of this is set in stone. And as you can see, as I'm manipulating this, if I don't like something, I can just get rid of it. So if I don't like these arms, you know, I can start erasing them. And this is all just doing basically just a click and drag on a tablet. So ZBrush will use, you know, pressure sensitivity um, for any Wacom devices. If you're coming from Proco's kind of stuff, you probably already have one of these devices and you've already been using it, say inside of Photoshop to establish your concept sculpting. And so the basic principle is just using this kind of methodology of just building these forms. And I'll noodle with this stuff um, for quite a while. There's a lot of different ways you can build um, inside of ZBrush. So you can build with just primitives as well. So if I wanted to just come through and say, uh, just take a simple shape and just use it as a primitive aspect, you can definitely do that. We also have these things called mannequins and also Z-spheres. And these will allow you to, you know, have this kind of primitive base that you can start from and then use those uh, as a starting point as well. And then additionally, some things I'll hit on here in a little bit is also, say, uh, reference images. You can load those in. But there's also now, with the advancements in 3D scanning and technology, uh, you have the ability to, you know, bring in actual 3D reference into your scene too. And then you can use that to to kind of sculpt from or modify different things. Now we also have sculpting brushes too, which I can use to kind of build up shapes and forms. And we'll come through and start building up mass and kind of things around this. Now for most of the times when I'm doing, you know, at least kind of starter shapes like this, this is basically my process. So you can see the model's kind of floating all over the place. I'm building up, you know, different masses in different areas and just playing with the uh, shapes here. Now, none of this is set in stone. I know roughly where I want stuff at, but I'm not refining at this stage. I'm just trying to get a global kind of bulk silhouette done here. And the other thing with this is, you know, speed is definitely in process here. And I can initially tell when I'm working on stuff if it's wrong or right. Um, I don't need to go in to, and to uh, kind of manipulate or modify things at a really small level. If it's bad, it's already bad. Like there's no point in me going in and, you know, trying to manipulate something that isn't where I want it to be. So that's another thing with speed that I find that I do a lot. If it's, if it's looking like garbage already, um, I can just trash it and then restart and I can get back to where I was, you know, a lot quicker. But this is the kind of basic block out here. So just smoothing forms and then pulling my shapes out. And these can all be refined, you know, a million times as well. Now let's see what we got for questions here. And one thing nice about this is that anytime, if you don't like something, <laughs> you can just get rid of it. We also have masking applications too, and this uh, mask will kind of work uh, in different ways to your advantage too. So I can easily come in and manipulate kind of weights and shapes too. Now, a lot of times if you're doing things like this, I mean, this is all very early in the kind of block out stage here, but just adding, you know, little dynamic areas to things or fixing kind of areas quickly um, is another thing to kind of go and do. And you can do that with masking to kind of protect elements. So his arms are a little bit skinny here, so I need to go and inflate them up some. And my inflate is going crazy right now. I don't know why. That could be part of it. So Think Logical is asking, uh, how specific are you focused on anatomy during the blackout stage? Really not much. Um, so I know I want the uh, initial kind of aspect for the mesh. Um, oh man, why didn't we die in mesh here? But I'm not too concerned about the full anatomy. Another thing with this character too, um, in terms of him having a lot of, say, uh, 
kind of um, clothing already applied to him is that the him himself is going to be covered with a lot of this stuff. So I don't need to flesh out fully, you know, every single anatomy muscle and everything like that. Like he's got a lot of armor on top of him. He's got a lot of um, different attributes that uh, really I don't need to touch. And so with this, um, I kind of leave them as they are and then uh, come back later and refine those areas if needed. But I will come through and, you know, depending on what I'm doing, I try to flush in, you know, at least kind of initial kind of anatomy stuff, not really anything strategic, but just things that, you know, bulk shapes, kind of cross-section areas, things like that. But I don't go through and fully flesh everything out. You can, um, but for, depending on what it is, the silhouettes, the, the big thing through here, and just finding those areas and pulling them out. And the one thing nice about this process is that you can just keep going. And so if you want hands and fingers, These uh, legs are killing me right now. And usually I'm tutorial mode. This uh, the sculpting stuff is, uh, I don't think I've ever sculpted on live stream. <laughs> I do a lot of talking. And I basically will noodle or meddle with stuff until I'm extremely happy with it. And so like, it's not anything that's I just finish in like a really quick amount of time and I'll often will redo a lot of things in there. But the main premise I wanted to get across in this aspect of just how you can build in ZBrush is just the ability to kind of grow things out with this mode. So you can see I can add fingers really quick. Um, if I'm further along, right, I can take this and add say horns and things like that. And you can really just play with this functionality of adding and subtracting forms and get really creative elements out of it. So I'm gonna jump ahead to a little more fresh version out of that. So I'm gonna go in the light box here. And in here, I have a version of this guy. And here we have more of that kind of fleshed out. So this is what I'd end up getting to um, with my sculpting. And the speed on this just depends um, on what I'm kind of going through and doing with it. So this was, you know, about an hour uh, to get to this stage, just me going back in and just meddling with the forms and shapes. And all I was doing with these was coming in and I was sculpting in that kind of positive fashion and then I'd smooth it out and just go in and out until I get my forms. So this one's pretty close in terms of um, what I was kind of looking for in terms of the element here. Now there are some things that are not consistent with Scott's concepts, which I would modify too. So with my mesh here, I had them as that kind of digital clay and then I uh, retopologized them. We have a process inside here which will look at the sculptural geometry and you can actually retopologize the entire mesh and get this kind of low res version out of it. And after I have this low res version, I now have these subdivisions. So I have like basically different steps I can go to to see them smooth and then unsmooth. And when he's in this unsmooth state, I can reposition them and change them. Now when I'm working with Anatomy 2, like uh, especially like at this stage, you know, I kind of want to go in and maybe fix some things. Um, I don't want to flush out full anatomy on it, but there's like things on the back it's missing, like I need to pull some of these things out. And one thing ZBrush has that's really cool, in addition to say just this silhouette mode here, is there's a mode in here that is called um, split screen. And what split screen allows you to do, it allows you to take, say, this digital reference or a 3D scan data. And you could bring it in and you could say, use it, but instead of doing that, you probably want to end up learning. And one thing with anatomy, you know, the more you do it and the more you learn with it, the better you're gonna get out of it. So what you can do is I can bring in some scan data. And so here I have some uh, scan data here, and this is from the uh, 3D scan store. So a company called 1024 has a scan store. They're running a big sale right now, if you guys wanna check out any of this. And I can load this in, and this is a scan of a human. And now I have, you know, if you're studying anatomy and things like that, you can have you know multiple images in 2D format. You could have maybe you know a resin quality printed version of the model, but then you can also go even further and just get a digital version of it. Now, when you have the digital version of it, um, the main process here is that I can use this on one side of my screen, and then I can use my model I'm sculpting on the other, and I can now see them in the same plane of reference. So instead of continuing to talk about this here, let's just go ahead and do it. 
So I have my base here and I'm just gonna select that and then I'm just gonna turn on my uh, scan data. So I have him kind of floating in the same world. Now the character that we have here with Scott, he's not you know full humanoid, right? So he is an alien, he's this pixel ranger. He's always into like this area that gains a lot of depth. Um, so he has, you know, things that you want to relate to in terms of anatomy, but he's not, you know, fully anatomical, right? Like his arms are really long and things like that, but you can still use anatomy from life and kind of establish different elements to it. So I'm going to come up here and here we have a kind of a split screen mode, and this is going to end up splitting our screen in half. And so now on the one side, I have the anatomy version there. Let me just move my thing out of the way here. We're gonna go live over here for a second. And I have my other model on the other side. And as you can see, this is gonna mimic what I do. So if I rotate the model, my scan data is gonna rotate, right? And I can rotate back, rotate like this. And so now I have the mesh I'm working for, working on, and then I have a digital reference. And so I can use this as a guide to say, come in and start sculpting on it. So if there's certain elements on the back that I want to kind of work out, so like say like the shoulder blades through here, I can see these now in a model as well. And now I can come through and flesh these out. And so this is one thing, especially if you're you know, new to ZBrush and you're coming from say Proco's world, um, definitely this is a huge learning tool, right? So you can use this to enhance your stuff, enhance your, your uh, models and make them more you know, believable. And this is not, you know, it's, it's using digital reference to your advantage. So yeah, you could take the scan data and end up using it, but that's kind of like, you know, it's, it's not really creating, you're not learning from that, but using it as a digital reference in this state, you can now see and come through and I can start describing, you know, these different uh, forms through here and I can see it on the other model and then use that as my reference. So this split screen option just lives in the transform palette up here and there's just a split screen slider here. And to get it to set up, you just need to have both tools in your scene inside of ZBrush here and you have your original model and then you can have your scan data right there. And then as soon as you activate split screen, it's going to take the model you have selected and put it on one side and then all your other sub tools that have this little eyeball icon on are going to be put on the other side. And so now I can come through and start, you know manipulating this out. So this is the other process I kind of do, and it's the same kind of build up as I go around here, right? So I'm building my kind of base. And most of the times I'd have a kind of model that's probably already fleshed out and started in terms of this process. So I'm not end up doing this every single time, because if you're doing it every time, you know, you're, you're not really using or harnessing the power of uh, say the digital models, right? So you can always reuse assets and that's another thing that's going to speed up your uh, kind of processes, especially where you're trying to, you know, block things out. And you can just manipulate the form as well um, quickly. And you can definitely carve in and do, you know, anything I want here. So I need to fix kind of this area through here. And then for even, say, large scale type changes on my meshes too, I can go and add those as well and still have that reference over there. So I can switch to, say, a lower version here of my model. And now I can make even larger scale changes. So we talked about his arms, you know, like right now they're falling to more of a realistic type format where the, the fingers will come, about, you know, halfway between the knee and the, uh, the waist of your character. But you can see in Proko's... Uh, and the concept here from Scott, he's definitely, you know, that, that fist is going all the way down uh, to his knees. So that would be also, you know, something that we would want to expand on. So coming in and say grabbing that there, and then I can use this little gizmo 3D here, and I can grow those out really quick and get them down to more of that kind of length that we had there on Scott's model. And one thing nice about working in this kind of uh, way is so I sculpted my mesh first just to get a base silhouette. I then remeshed it with a, a, pro, a process we have in here called Z Remesher. And then after that mesh is in low res, I then put the details from my sculpt back onto it. And now I have this way to work with my model where I can make large changes on the low resolution version, which doesn't contain all this detail. And that allows me to make quickly modified changes. And then I can just scroll back up and those high resolution details are going to go back on it. So you can see now I've just adjusted those hands quickly on the mesh there. Now, some other things, you know, you can just kind of play with the forms here and the shape, but this would probably be about the level I take, at least for a concept model, um, before I actually went in and started, you know, detailing different things on it. 
But that's my, my general base mess process there. Now, another thing I want to show, and then we'll get into kind of the designing of his different elements there, is that uh, another thing to think about when you're modeling any characters, and this is one thing, especially if you're learning, you know, initially inside of 3D, maybe you came from a 2D background, um, is that there is, um, I'm trying to, <laughs> I can remember the name of it now, but uh, slices. Uh, so if you think about, um, how forms are, right? So if you think about a leg or something like that, it's not just a cylindrical shape, right? It's also not just a tube, right? So it has these different contours that go around and that's the cross sections that kind of build up a mesh. And one thing when you're coming from 2D, you're kind of looking at the outside shapes to give you those kind of cross sections. Uh, but when you're in 3D, those cross sections really matter. And what this means is that if you have something and the cross section or the isn't correct, the way that form fits when you rotate the model, it's gonna look weird. And so oftentimes, if you've just started in 3D and you rotate a model, you'll notice things, you know, uh, like the area through here, like you can see, like this is a little bit thin right through here, right? So it looks, you know, okay through here, but as you rotate, it may be thin. And that's because the cross section isn't equaling what it should. So with cross sections uh, on this, let me just get out of split screen mode here, is that you can check these with say digital reference too. And this is extremely helpful, especially in a learning sense. Um, so if I have my model here, I have the ability in ZBrush where I can take objects and generate subtraction forms from them on the fly. And so if I come over here and just append in say a cube, and we're gonna just append in two of these guys. So here's my one cube, and then I'm gonna just duplicate this quick, and I wanna leave a little gap in the middle like this. And then now I'm gonna set this to a basically a subtractive mode through here. And then I wanna come through and turn on my live Boolean process. And what this is doing inside of ZBrush, it's taking this shape I made, and now it's using it and it's subtracting from that 3D scan data. And what I can do now is I can take this and I can scroll it up and down and I can look at these cross sections. So this is a big thing um, in terms of just kind of like learning attributes too, because as you can see, as this is going up and down the model, you can see the cross section that it creates, right? And so this is what the 3D form is as well. So you gotta remember if you're doing anything in 3D, these aren't just cylinders, right? So the leg is not just a cylinder. As you can see, this is the area directly below the knee. And you can see this is the form, this is the cross section. And this is also comes into play a lot with um, say fingers and things like that too, where you wanna make sure that your cross sections are correct and that's a big part of 3D as well. So you can use this kind of tool inside of ZBrush and I can analyze just the cross sections of the mesh of this 3D scan data. So this is a great way to kind of see and visualize, hey, that's how the hand kind of form should be, right? So we have the inner palm that's scooped inward and then you have the outer side, which is like that con, uh, convex surface. And so you can see that clearly this is the shape, right? It's almost giving you like this crescent moon. So when you're building hands, this gives you insight to how that hand should look in 3D. So all sorts of uh, cool things you can kind of do like this. And since you have a 3D model, you can experiment and try these and kind of further strengthen your kind of design process. So one little thing there, if you want uh, some learning aspects in terms of anatomy, especially if you're coming from say Proco side there, so you can grab 3D assets and then use them and kind of identify different things on them and help your sculptural stuff. So now I've gone through and you know I've modified my uh, base form here. And so this is what I kind of ended up with, right? So I elongated his arms a little bit. Um, I've got him kind of that bulk. I wanted to make sure that I keep this, you know, kind of sloping process through here. So this is the grizzly bear, the, uh, the bison, the stuff that Scott was talking about where he wanted, you know, this kind of shape brings this kind of personality to this character. So this is one thing we definitely want to come through and focus on. Now at this stage I've got my base and most of the times if I'm modeling anything, sometimes I'm modeled the little bits first, um, but oftentimes if I do that, I'm modeling elements that maybe I want to hit on to describe a certain style or elements on a model where I know when I get to the end of it, I'm not going to have as much fun uh, working on. And so things often start with characters personally are I'll focus on hands or, or feet and then we'll go into the main elements. Um, and you can also break things down when you're doing stuff in terms of, say, uh, checklists, right? So oftentimes, you know, if I look at, say, Scott's uh, image here, 
if, I, if I'm modeling him 100% um, for how he is, like what's my checklist here? What are these different parts? And so these parts are not fused on the model, right? This, the, uh, say the tentacles, that could be part of his body, but then you have his helmet or whatever. That's a different element, right? So it's a detached part from that character. So when I model these things too, I try to model them in a way uh, that they exist in real life. And this also brings another level of believability into them. Uh, so if the helmet is separate from the model, if helmets are separate from the body, then model the helmet separately. Uh, this also would just kind of like bring in kind of that functionality to it. Now at any time, since it is a digital file, I could merge them all together and make one mesh. But in general, I want to keep you know, these things kind of segmented and separate if they are segmented and separate. So with my model here, the first thing I kind of want to establish is definitely the head there. So these are the few elements um, that the art director really was keen on keeping. So we have this mask and this helmet with this very shiny, opaque surface. Um, and then we also have these tentacles, right? Um, so those are key elements that must stay with this design. Now, I was looking at these, you know, I want to elaborate on some of them, but I also really like how they are. So I know I want these tentacles and I know I want the helmet. So I'm not really going to change much in terms of anything on that because they're a key element the art director liked. And they're also part of this character's like style and form. And they're also creating a cohesion with the rest of the team. So that helmet is consistent with every single character. So that's an element that has to stay. So when I start this kind of process here, I'll, you know, as we talked about the helmet being separate, I'll come through and I'll append in just a sphere. And so here I just have a sphere object here. And once again, as I did earlier, where I was just kind of going through and pulling out shapes, I'm gonna do the same process with the helmet. So I can manipulate this and kind of focus this initial kind of element here. And the helmet itself is kind of orbish, right? So we're looking like kind of like an egg shape, maybe add a little taper through here. And one thing with this too, as I'm working on the model, I probably won't need his neck as well. So I can come in quickly, just kind of smooth that out. Um, and then I'm not going to be focusing on the neck and it's not going to be interpenetrating my surface there. And so I can just scrub this down on my mesh there to kind of remove it. And then I can go back up and smooth this out. So now he's got, he's got no head. And now I can just see the aspect of this uh, kind of helmet design here. Now when I'm working this, I work pretty, try to work pretty quick to establish my forms, moving things around. Um, the uh, option here for this is just basically, I'll just use the move brush and the snake hook brush, which are my two go-tos. Also with my geometry here on this, um, you can see it's kind of giving me this pull at the top. And when I start sculpting on this, this may cause issues because all these points are kind of going to it. So I'll just quickly go to the geometry area and just run this at a low resolution DynaMesh. Um, Dynamesh is a process inside ZBrush that will go through and retopologize the entire surface of the model. And its goal is to try to give you even distribution of polygons. So if you're working with clay and you say you have a ball of clay and you make one sculpt here and you make another sculpt there, that sculptural mark is going to be consistent across the entire surface. So the Dynamesh process inside of ZBrush will allow you to take that and uh, kind of mimic that as it would exist in real life. So if I come through and move things and then redynamesh it's gonna give me a, a nice surface. And I'll just pull this kind of shape out. Now, one thing I like doing a lot with helmets too is I want some sort of dynamic kind of helmet edge, right? So I don't really want it to be like a pure orb because that's kind of you know, not really flushing out much of a shape here. And it just kind of adds another element to it. And then it has a sort of taper at the top too. Now, as you're doing this, um, you know, this is pretty much a you know, the glass part of it, but I want to add the other element as well. And instead, you know, I could come in and say sculpt everything on this model. So I could come in and say, get my, my other brush. And then I could start coming in and trying to, you know, design this kind of form right up the model, like pull this kind of stuff out and then deal with that glass surface at the same time. But once again, going back to how this would be built in life, that glass is going to be separate from that external shell of the frame. And so modeling it that way is going to give me a clearer uh, transition between those two elements, which is going to hit your eyes going to go right to that transition area and it's going to be nice and clean. And I don't have to worry about coming in and cleaning up that transition for the entire time. So what I'll do is I'll take my initial kind of glass part here and I'll just make another sub tool. So I have two of these and then I'll take that second one and scale it up and maybe mush it down a little bit. And now I have this object that I can now use separately from that glass. So I can use the glass and then add this element to it 
and now I can manipulate one from the other. So if I like the shape of the glass, it's gonna stay, it's not gonna hurt uh, when I'm sculpting the other process. Let me check on questions here as I get some water quick. Uh, so the program I'm currently using for reference over here is just called Pure Ref. Um, so it's really nice and handy. Um, you can actually go through and just you know load a bunch of images in and then it can live inside here. Uh, ZBrush also has the process you can use inside of ZBrush that's called uh, Spotlight. And Spotlight will also let you uh, have images. Um, and you can have those floating on your uh, screen as well. But I had a lot of stuff kind of loaded in this one. Uh, so I just kind of put it in here as a little easier way to kind of manipulate the form. So for my tablet right now that I'm using, it's a uh, <laughs> Intuos Pro. Uh, generally, so this is not my traditional kind of workspace. Uh, so this is a, my internet connection uh, at my studio is not good at all. And so I work, uh, I come here to a remote uh, conference room basically and bring a laptop with me. Uh, and so I'm on tablet mode right now, but my preferred device is definitely a Cintiq and I have a uh, 24 inch Cintiq at home that I end up using. So now I can pull these out and start kind of manipulating my shapes through here. Now the process right now, I'm just moving these kind of elements around, playing with the forms and the designs. And this allows me to see like, oh, okay. So like, what would this helmet look like? He's got these kind of tentacles kind of coming around it and interlacing. Uh, so we want to hit those too. But what does the helmet look like if you take those away? And that's one aspect that you kind of want to think about when you're doing things because it could come into play, like if they decide later, or you know, you remove the tentacles or something happens. It also brings in more form and function in your design. So thinking about that kind of aspects, like, well, does this go down all the way? Are these tentacles built up around it? Do they kind of connect inside? Like, are the tentacles part of his face and the helmet's out of it? So that all comes into, you know, just the, the sculptural design process of this. So figuring out where you know, if they're part of his face, do they come through here and does he have like ports on the side of this helmet here? And then we'd want to make sure that with anything we design too, even though it is fictional, um, you kind of want to bring in, you know, L to that element of reality, right? So if the port or the helmet is going through his shoulders like this, that's not realistic, right? So it's not, it, it may work, you know, in terms of sense of just like, whatever you want to do, <laughs> but it's not something that would happen in life and happen in the real world. It's not bringing in that believability. So when you work on things like this, you want to make sure that this helmet, you know, stays out of his body there, right? So he's got this mass, he's got this form. We want to adhere to those principles as we're kind of sculpting on stuff. And I'll just go through and mess with these kind of shapes and designs here. And I can actually hit and, you know, enforce these different elements and play with the uh, visible shapes here. And one thing I like to do a lot when I'm, you know, modeling stuff well, I like to also think about say ridges or light hitting areas as well. Uh, so the transitions are definitely gonna be one between these two models here. You can see I have this transition and this, but then like say on the back here, right? So if he comes around the character there, you know, what, what does his back of his helmet kind of look like? Does it slope down a little bit like this? Does this come across, you know, maybe up he has like a little kind of ridged bar there. I also like his kind of spikes as well too. So that's another one that I probably bring back into it, even though it wasn't one of the required kind of uh, constraints that say the art director had. Um, it is a cool element and it does give a nice silhouette form there. So that's one thing I think would also be nice here. And you can see this process through here, what I'm doing now, since this shape is underneath it, um, I don't have to worry about, um, say, it getting weird. Because, right, I just have a, like if I activate soul here, this is the shape I have. So to expose anything underneath the shape, I just need to pull it out in front of the other volume. So if I want to add, say, you know, weird kind of eye things maybe, right, I can just pull it out from that surface and it's going to come through. And then I can also occlude by that as well. So we were talking about earlier, like, well, what kind of, you know, maybe he has a display screen that's kind of built into his helmet here. So you can definitely play with that just by pushing and pulling elements in space. And just as that element passes through the other element, you get a design. Um, I don't have to modify the element itself. I don't have to worry about its topology. I'm just sculpting. And if there's something I like, I can go with it. 
So it's very creative and kind of free form in this process. And see so like through here, like I know like he's got these kind of dipped kind of forms through there. So I can definitely just push that surface in and it's gonna expose that other glass sphere that I made. And you can see now I'm starting to see that through there. And then I can go back to the glass sphere and say so move that down so it fills that space. And I can just manipulate this. And I can also put a uh, series of uh, you know, things called dynamic subdivisions, which will allow me to see the model if it was divided up or high resolution. And this will give that kind of glass shape now, this interesting kind of form to it, right? So now it's not as harsh. And I can continue playing with this. And then at this stage, I usually go into the, the happy little trees, Bob Ross mode. You can definitely tell when I'm in kind of like a creative sculptural mode because everything will kind of go slow and come down into play. And for a lot of this, the, the roughness, like I try to work in terms of um, kind of adding a form and then I'll go back in and smooth it. And my brain also works in terms of uh, shape finding. Uh, so I'll have an idea or a kind of idea I want to hit a concept. But then as I see something um, on my model, you know, I'll definitely kind of elaborate on that or change it on the fly. And see so this interaction between here allows me to get, you know, I can make a really sharp edge pretty easy just by sculpting now, instead of going in and say, adding another element there. And it's pretty much like kind of like a non-destructive workflow too. You can play with the shapes and forms. And oftentimes I won't spend, you know, too much time on each part because the main goal here for at least the initial process is I want to get the bulk of the elements that are kind of required done first. And then I can go in and start noodling these things a little bit more. So this also looks a little bit too big right now. So if I zoom out, I can see here, like it's, it's definitely too large compared to what the concept is. And so he has this kind of tiny head and these big broad shoulders. So I can now, since these are separate tools, I can adjust these two and I can scale them up and down. Um, I can even go as far inside of ZBrush as linking these together. If I get my uh, mode here back, there we go. And then now, I need to scale this entire thing here. And kind of get it back on track in terms of size and scale there, right? And so since it's digital, you know, I don't have to redraw. Um, this wouldn't be too bad in terms of 2D because you just lasso select and scale it up or down. But in the digital format world, like I'm not going to lose anything from that, you know, just by scaling it down. I can scale things up as big and as small as I want and it doesn't matter because it's just moving all those pixels along the way. All right, let me see if we got any questions here while I get a drink of water. I see Daisuke's in here from uh, Pixelog here asking questions. Thank you, Daisuke. Let's see here. Uh, Think Logical's asking, do I always do my stuff like this or do I use morph targets too? Uh, morph targets will be used primarily, for me, they were primarily used in uh, production only. So if you had something that was already set in stone, um, you would have a morph target and then you'd be able to blend that to another character. So if I was doing, you know, this is a conceptual aspect, so I'm just taking his concept and I'm generating a 3D version of the concept with additions, changes, um, and kind of going that back and forth. At this stage, I'm not set to a morph target. So what that means is that I have freedom to do whatever I want. Um, so if I want to add spikes to his shoulders, um, if I want to rip his entire arm off, I can go ahead and do that. I'm not constrained to that morph target keeping it. Now in a production sense, uh, this model would eventually end up getting basically retopologized or fit probably onto an existing uh, kind of rig. And that rig in terms of game stuff um, will use morph targets in order to save down memory. So if you have an instance version of the model, you can create multiple versions of it and all you do is just change the model's kind of vertices through that morph target and it'll change how it looks. 
So I could make a skinny guy and a big guy have the use the same topology, and just by using that morph target, you can get both those characters for the cost of one. Um, so that's really the the main usage of morph targeting in terms of uh, pipelines. It's also, if you have a character already rigged and you just use a morph target to it, you don't have to make a new rig for that character. Um, but this stage, for, in terms of this model here, um, I'm free to do what I want. Um, and so I'll often even go to a stage now where I'll work on this model and I'll start sculpting in you know, the different elements. So let's say now I want to go to his, you know, say shoulder area here. Um, as I'm doing this and after I get, you know, kind of this stuff flushed out, I'll go through and uh, take my models and even slice them up. So even in the terms of just the, the process itself, in terms of this kind of new IP uh, situation, uh, basically after we have this 3D concept done, I can even take it further and say hand it off to animators. And so oftentimes if you're doing an IP, you want to get some of your senior animators to look at the model as well. Um, because basically, like his shoulder pad here, if the character is always going to be in this low blocky poles, uh, carrying this gigantic compression hammer, you know, and he's going through the entire game or film, and that's his pose, that shoulder pad works, works fine. If this character now does a lot of climbing, where he's reaching up and grabbing things or scaling buildings, that shoulder pad, those animators are going to come back and they're going to be so mad at you. <laughs> so it, it comes down to that kind of stuff too. So often, if we, when I would generate a uh, concept model from back and forth with the concept that are like artists like Scott, we'd also hand it off to an animator and say, hey, here's a quick rig. You can then test it and see what it looks like. That process of this model too, even if it's just segmented and not fully rigged, can also be thrown in the game engine, can be thrown into an environment as well. And you could see the model in the world. And it's kind of that initial uh, phase of the concept planning that you, end up with less rework, if that makes sense. So if you can hit or figure out those things early on, and you can do it even in the 3D concept phase, um, and give a head up to the animator, or give their input on stuff, then you're gonna save a lot of changes on the end. So if the animator looks at it and goes, hey, this shoulder pad's perfect for what he wants to do, but then they're like, oh, well, we want him to jump and do this, then it's caught early on. And so we're not redoing the entire um, the model <laughs> over from scratch. So that's one thing definitely that's a benefit with uh, 3D kind of concepting too to go along with your 2D concepting is it depends if the end goal is, you know, this certain element, then uh, you can get that stuff figured out. Now for his, say, like his other elements here, like I, I, I like that big kind of uh, Potemkin style stuff where there's this thing that he fits on, right? So he's got this whole kind of armor set that goes on his shoulders and it keeps that bulk on it. It may also have a little pouch on the back for his little rig guy right here. Um, another thing I know that Scott had in one of his videos was the rig has this little like uh, pointy kind of boomerang type thing. Cause if you think about like, you know, sidekicks with kids like Mad Max, you had the boomerang kid too, back to the, the Master Blaster stuff. Well, you know, even if this ended up being like a humorous type game, you know, I could see, you know, talking about the shoulder pad again, you know, compression hammer here. He grabs the little, his little buddy rig by that boomerang and then he can throw him, right? And so like maybe he curls up into a ball and now he like spins through the air and that's like could be one of his attacks or uh, kind of power plays that he has. So there's those kind of elements too you can bring into your designs um, as well to kind of give that story or functionality to it. And that's a big thing that I know Scott was going into when he was uh, st talking about his stuff here. And it's also one thing that I try to hit on is the believability, the realism, and bring story to it. Because uh, I know he was going in on the shoulder pads about, you know, maybe he got hit by a sword and it had some damage on it. And that kind of element, you know, don't just do the shapes in 3D because they're just shapes. Like, try to figure out why it exists. And then bringing that element into it will end up making it more believable. And so there we go, we can just kind of pull his. Now another thing with kind of like this big shoulder pad thing here, this is another kind of, you know, design element I kind of like. Like I like the, the idea that the stuff on the back around his head here has this kind of bulk to it and kind of goes around, right? Now in addition to his compression hammer too, if we think about well, what powers this thing, right? So this is a big, big device. So it has to have some sort of power supply to it. And so with that, even on say the back of the character, um, just kind of even just pre-thinking about this, I could add say something like a, uh, 
Maybe there's some sort of electrical turbine device that lives here, right? So he has this kind of element on the back, you know, kind of like a, a maybe in a, a uh, backwards kind of Iron Man, right? And so that would live on the back of his mesh there. And as you can see, like, check out the, um, let's move this out of the way. Check out the silhouette up here and just see like, you know, how would that would look if this model is like running around, right? And then I can add different tapers on it and things like that too. So I can come through and manipulate this. Now ZBrush not only does sculpting stuff too, we also have um, a bunch of different processes in here that will allow you to poly model. And so one thing I'll do too, if I'm just creating a shape like this, is that I can come in and actually, you know, manipulate this shape quickly to add more form to it. So I liked this kind of circular thing here, but this taper I'm getting over here in the silhouette is, isn't working for me. So I can extrude this out and then I can, you know, do different processes with this, just using another brush inside of ZBrush. And this allowed me to scale and change different attributes. So now I can, you know, taper it and see what it looks like with a little more curvature. Um, I can also then, you know, move it out and manipulate it and see kind of what it looks like. What if it's angled? So maybe it's like more downward cast. So that's actually giving this kind of like, we talk a lot about, um, if you're ever designing stuff too, just thinking of things in terms of uh, uh, flats and curves. Um, so an example of this would be say, anything that's pretty much on the human body. Um, if I open up the, uh, that scan data again and just select it really quick here. A perfect example of this is like down the leg area, right? So you usually have a very straight on the back and then the calf ends up making a curve. And this kind of dynamic is a, a huge thing in terms of, you know, just characters and design. Um, it's kind of this play on curve and then straight, curve and straight, curve and straight. And it's a, it's a big element um, in terms of a lot of things. So curve, straight, um, it's all over the place. And so this is one thing also consciously um, you should be aware of as you're kind of uh, modeling stuff too. And after you do it for a while, it kind of just gets built in. So even if I go back to say my, my base character here, even just me just messing with say this helmet aspect, as I'm doing this, you, you can start to see these shapes are already kind of getting ingrained. So we got a straight and a curve, right? And then this, you know, it ended up being more of a straight too, and then has this little curve here. So you can see I'm already just subconsciously <laughs> generating these assets or these shapes on my designs. And same with like curves and straights. Uh, so another thing just with 3D art. Uh, let's get these questions here quick. So we have one question about, let's see here, hold on. So Jim's asking about hierarchy of linked uh, items. So inside of ZBrush, the items are basically gonna live as their own kind of elements uh, to start off. So they're gonna be basically their own tools or their own sub tools in your scene. So with these, you can manipulate them, you can merge them together if you want, you can then break them back off. But they're pretty much gonna live independently. So as you can see here with the helmet, like this is a separate part, separate part, separate part. And these form their own different sub tools in my scene. And so this allows me to keep things separate as I work, which helps because if I need to turn something on and off and quickly do that. Um, but at any time you could merge them together and get those to be a part of the mesh. Uh, there's also things inside of ZBrush that are called uh, polyframes or uh, polygroups. And polygroups allows you to sign these kind of individual selection sets into each of your sub tools as well. So you can isolate parts, you can hide different things and work on certain elements. Um, so that's kind of the way you would go through and kind of link places together. The other linking I did when I moved the helmet is with the uh, Gizmo 3D, there is a, um, an option that you can do when this is activated. And it's this little icon right here that's called transpose all selected subtools. And that'll let you go through and tell ZBrush which subtools you wanna move. And then after you have those highlighted, you can move and scale on them independently. So we have a question, does this model be available for animation after? Potentially, if you have, we have any animators that are interested in <laughs> making this guy run around, I'd, I'd be willing to uh, distribute the model. You may have to do some cleanup because uh, it probably won't be animation you know, fully fleshed out. 
uh, we'll go through in the talk. I'll have them segmented at least so you kind of can see the process that I would go through to hand it off to an animator for a test model um, eventually in one of the other streams. Uh, so another question with just the building of stuff. So we had a question about how I'm selecting uh, polygons. This is basically uh, a ZBrush kind of user question here. So let's say I have my shape here. And if I want to quickly select things, if you have the ZModeler brush selected and you hold down Alt, this will give you this temporary polygroup. And anywhere you apply this temporary polygroup, when you perform an action, it's going to do it everywhere to those spaces. So if I do say this and extrude it out, and get all of it happening at once. So there's a lot of things inside ZBrush that will save you time in terms of things like that. Um, but the base kind of principle, if you're definitely you know new to ZBrush in itself, is try not to get bogged down in all the different things. So there's a ton of advanced features in here, and just focus primarily on your shapes and your forms, and just using like you know the to start off, use your basically your uh, few basic brushes. Um, you can follow some of the tutorials on Z Classroom and some of the things like that, and that'll allow you to get kind of something going inside of ZBrush and get that sculptural version of your, say, 2D art. All right, so now I got this kind of like bulked out through here. Now, one thing with this in Scott's concept, you can see the tentacles are kind of going over top of this element here. So right now I may have this, you know, a little bit too high in relation to the uh, chest here. So I, I might need to actually go back and do something you know, lower like this eventually. But right now I'm gonna leave it where it is and um, I'm gonna try to, you know, go in and say, focus some on the uh, tentacle aspects here and then maybe throw in some horns quickly just to kind of get that kind of visual read there and see if it's something that's playing well together with the, you know, the silhouette of the back, make sure they're not gonna like occlude and see if I'm still getting an interesting kind of design or uh, silhouette off of the mesh there. Now you notice at this stage too, I'm not detailing anything in. I'm still just pulling shapes and pulling forms. Um, if you don't like anything, it's a quick change through here. Um, so you don't have to worry about, you know, if you detail something up really high and then you have to make a change to it, it may be a little bit difficult and you may have to redo that part. So one thing to make sure that even Scott was hitting on in his video is, you know, flush out your shapes first and then go in and add the details. Because if the shapes don't work, they're not gonna work when you add the details. You can add as many details as you want, and if the shapes don't work, it's not gonna go anywhere. <clears throat> so with this um, here, we have some of these uh, kind of brushes we can play with. So ZBrush also has uh, a bunch of different attributes. Let me shrink my ranger here down a little bit. I'm gonna move him down some. You'll be back, you'll be back. I'll sit you right here. So with this, we have a bunch of different ways you can kind of create too. Now, I've been doing mostly just the sculpting side of stuff. So I'll pen an object and then deform it. Um, in addition to this, we also have the ability to add different parts. And so some of the additions we can do with this is we can um, add just geometry elements to it and deform them. We can add all these little parts like clothing attributes and things like that. And these are all done through a series of brushes that just contains mesh parts. So as an example of this, if I have, say, this brush selected, you see this is going to give me a list here at the top. And this list is going to show me all these different pieces that are in this kind of brush. And this will give you the kind of a kit bashing type element to it. Now, I wouldn't technically do it at this stage right now, but I'm going to use it as a way to get a piece for these horns, and then I can manipulate it. Um, but this will allow me to take, say, any of these objects in here. And there's a whole bunch in here. You can hit M on your keyboard too, and it'll kind of show you all the different parts that are in this brush. So this is just a model kit brush here. And I'm just gonna go and grab the say cone shape. And then if I come across the model here, I can come through and just drag, and I can start adding just primitive forms to it. So if I wanted to say, you know, if, if I liked, if the art director liked or wanted me to keep, say these spikes on his arms, right? All I would need to do is say, grab this and pull these out. And I could come through and add spikes quickly to the mesh, right? And that's just taking this shape and inserting it to another poly. So it's very easy to, you know, add that kind of detail as well. So what I wanna do is I wanna add this for say a sworn structure through here. And now that I have this, I've just had it added, I can split this to its own uh, sub tool now. And now I can manipulate it. So I've just used this brush as a way to get my shape. And then now I can manipulate that shape. So I can go back to my move brush if I hit the right button there 
And we're actually my snake hook brush. I'll make sure Sculptress is on. And now I can start pulling this up and kind of get that horn shape kind of flushed out. And with the horn shape too, one thing with this too, I want some sort of like a organic twist to it as well. Um, I don't want to really just have it come up as a flat element and thinking about the attributes and looking at this model, you know, at different angles, you want to make sure that when you do this, it reads all the way around. So this could be a really cool shape in 2D, but it may not work in 3D. And there's sometimes where that happens. Um, so if you take, say, like the Escher uh, drawing where he has, you know, the endless stairs, right? Like, you can't really build that <laughs> in terms of a tangible form because um, it's basically a trick in terms of, uh, you know, visualization. And so if it just was a render uh, for this model here, you could definitely, you know, do something like that. But when it's actually a 3D asset, you need to make sure that you play with all those forms and shapes and get them kind of fleshed out. And then once I have this, I can then come in and say manipulate it. Maybe just check and see, like, would it look better if it's up? Would it look better if it's down? Where I want that. Also, you can see the rig here in the drawing is using it as like a handle, right? So that's kind of like a, a staple point of this character to like give him a grip. So that's another thing why I, I'd probably keep that. You know, even if the art director is like, hey, you know, I don't know about the horns. I think it's a cool element to the character and it's applying a place where a connection can be made, right? So he can connect to rig and it's kind of like I'm on the shoulder and I can hold on to this. It gives you a cool silhouette between those two characters. Um, I can also duplicate this, so you see there's a secondary one through here, so I can just quickly clone that out, scale this down, I can then manipulate the one that's unmasked here, and just see how that looks, let me smooth this part out. And right now everything's symmetrical, and so in terms of kind of like speed processes, this is usually what you'd end up doing at the initial stages uh, through here because this is definitely gonna save you the you know, most time, right? So keeping things symmetrical, and then later you can come through and say, you know, make them asymmetrical. If I wanted one of the horns to be a different size or a different taper, I can come through and add that in and change it on the fly. I'm just trying to see you know, if this works, if this doesn't work, maybe too big, maybe too small. I'm just seeing where it fits in in terms of the kind of design. And I'll go back into happy little tree voice. Happy little trees. Checking on these questions here quick. Thank you, Pre-Drag, for answering some of the questions here. I get, off, I get on tangents and then sooner or later it's like, oh, <laughs> didn't do that part. Uh, another thing that's helpful when doing these uh, kind of things here is that if you sculpt in something with a lot of detail, um, it may end up looking messy, right? So I could spend a lot of time, say, on this mask here and trying to smooth this out. But one trick you can kind of do is you can just kind of remesh it and then end up getting a, uh, another version of it. And this is a handy kind of process inside of ZBrush in terms of, say, generating uh, wrinkles. Uh, so as an example of this, because it just crossed my mind here, we're gonna, we're gonna show it quick too. And so let's say I have this sphere, right? And I wanted to generate some sort of wrinkle on it, right? So I can just quickly carve in, you know, some sort of wrinkle format right here. This isn't gonna be anything, you know, spectacular. But say I have something like this. Right, and this could be anywhere on your characters, um, anything you want. Now, after you have this kind of designed, you know, I could go in and spend a lot of time, you know, cleaning this up, making it look precise, right? But instead of doing that, I can just go ahead and apply the zero mesh process to it, and it's going to lower it down uh, instantly. And as it lowers it down, it's going to try to keep multiple sculptable attributes I have on here, but then it's going to remove uh, everything else. And so this ends up creating this kind of process, especially with clothing and wrinkles, where you can come in and quickly sculpt the flow of things really quick, and then you can just uh, reduce it. And as it reduces, it's gonna clean it up a little bit, you know, remove some of that noise or that undulation. And then if I go back and say smooth it now, you see I'm gonna get kind of a result like this. 
So this is a good way, um, especially to clean up different surfaces on your model. You just sculpt them quick, get the kind of design out of it, and then you can soften it uh, using just a remesh process like Z-Remesher. So one little thing there, especially if you're doing, that's what I'll do a lot of it. So between now and the, the next time I stream, I may have most of this kind of done and fleshed out. So I want to just hit on that uh, a little bit there. Because definitely I'm not going to be able to cover everything in terms of uh, stream formats. So we'll be doing some versions and work on the model during non-streaming times. And then you guys will get to see kind of like the results and progress. And I'll talk about you know, the next streams, how I did different things and uh, processes along there. So this one for the mainstream here, I wanted to get more into the kind of conceptual size and the first flush out. So this one's almost like a pure kind of flush out uh, design here and just how I'd end up building stuff from nothing to where I'm at now. And the next one will be stepped up a little bit more and have stuff a little more finished. Um, and I'll talk about the different elements there. So now I got his helmets and I've got his body. Let's start messing with these tentacles. So tentacles are the same process as well, just as we kind of did the horns. Um, I can append a shape in, another sphere. So the sphere is usually the go-to um, for kind of design. And if you think about it in terms of like a traditional sense, um, you just take another ball of clay and just smack it onto your model, right? And then you can manipulate it. Um, so this is the kind of the best way to kind of do this kind of process here. Now with the tentacles here, you can see there's no symmetry on these at all. So this is definitely a more organic feel of these tendrils kind of going around and linking up. And so I want to keep that, right? So this would be one of the few places on this mesh um, where I wouldn't use symmetrical assets. Um, so I would actually would have to spend the time modeling these things asymmetrical. Um, another thing with the belt would be another good example too because it is offset. So you could do some symmetry stuff on things, um, but it's definitely going to have an angle there. Um, and then of course the gun arms only happen on one thing, but we'd model it, uh, model it in the center of the world and then move it later on. So with my little uh, sphere here, we're going to start kind of manipulating these kind of uh, tendrils here. Now I know they come out of these kind of ports on the side of the helmet, so I want to just establish that as my initial area. And I'm just gonna duplicate this so I have two of these guys you know, ready to go and they're just in position. And then I'm gonna take one of them and I'm gonna zoom in on Scott's concept here. And you can kind of see the flow in which he's got. So he's got one that's coming around and then they kind of do this like weird twisty stuff. Uh, this one's coming around doing the same. This one's coming like that. And the thing I wanna do when I make these is I wanna have them kind of like overlapping and going around each other because they're, they're tentacles, right? So they're just like, you know, all over the place. So as I do this, I wanna be you know, cautious of that and keeping them separate in terms of different subtools like this will allow me to change how they intersect and interact. And once again, as I model these, um, I wanna make sure that I'm kind of conforming to that element. And so what I did there was I just took that sphere and I just used the snake hook brush again with the Sculptures Pro Mode. And as I pull it, it's gonna pull that shape out. And so now I can generate this quick tendril, right? And so my initial process on these is I'd go through and just kind of generate my initial kind of shapes here. So just pulling these forms out and I want these kind of roughed in, right? So I have something like this where it's coming across. You can see I also, you know, in terms of the concept, you know, these tendrils are like all over the place. So they definitely occlude, they may go on top of each other. They're gonna go over the helmet. They could be on the goggle, they could be anywhere, right? So it's, it's part of the character's kind of personality too that I'd say would play in here. So I can take these and move them around um, and just see how I can get these to flow and form and kind of go across each other, wrap around each other, and kind of get this kind of dynamic element to it. Now, one thing when I'm doing this too, I don't really want them, you know, they can intersect as much as they want because it definitely is 3D, um, but I want to kind of increase that visibility aspect of it and make sure as I'm doing this that they're not intersecting too much. Like, I don't want this, right? All right, well, that's not, that's not a good example. That one would work. <laughs> I don't want this, right? So I can see that this tentacle, tentacle is, you know, 100% colliding with the other one. So you want to be cautious when you're doing this kind of process of coming in and making sure if you do any overlaps that you make it look like a believable uh, surface there. And another thing with these, I'll come through and do this kind of build-up patterns along the edges there. And this just allows you to kind of catch light and details on your surfaces. So as I'm coming through and sculpting these, I can move them around. And now I'm also getting this kind of textural quality too. Now this could all, this is all gonna go away probably at some point, but 
it just gives me another element here that I can play with and kind of catch light and see, okay, if that's where it is. So it doesn't look as smooth, right? And you also add like that kind of attribute of depth. So if you think of a tendril too, like it may have like a crease in it, it may have a vein in it. And so just adding those different elements. Now after I have like say two of these created like this, I can definitely save time and clone these and move them around and then use them as an element. So I don't have to start from that sphere every single time. So if I duplicate this one, I can then move it and then maybe move it here. I can flip it around. Not maybe too much flip. I can reposition it. And then I can go back in and do more of that manipulation. So this one, I definitely want to come from that kind of area over there. So I have this big one and this other one coming through. This one may overlap some and then maybe it fades out underneath the others. So I can go like that. So kind of making a scarf, <laughs> a scarf of tentacles. And then I can build up these shapes through here. And keeping them separate allows me to, you know, just, just more control. If I don't like something, I can definitely change it a lot easier than having them all grouped up. Happy little trees. Happy little trees. Let's check these questions here. So Dwayne's asking, so we have the ability inside of ZBrush to use curves too, um, which will allow you to create different things. So as an example of this, we have these curve brushes and these will allow you to take a part um, and you can create pretty much anything and you can instantly add an asset to it. So if I have say this um, shoelace here, I could come across the surface of my model and drag this out and I'd get this lace kind of replicated over it. Now I could have done a process like that where I'd create a tentacle and use it. Um, but the thing with the tentacles is I wanted them to be like getting some of these curves, um, maybe hard to get them with a uh, curve kind of uh, attribute. And so for me, the quickest way in this kind of process is to use that uh, sculptor's probability with the snake hook brush, because then I can just pull the form out really quick. And then I'm already in the mode of sculpting at that time. And so then I can just quickly come in to say, you know, that clay buildup brush and go through that process there. But there's no really right or wrong way um, to do things. It just depends on what you're doing as an artist at the time. Um, so I personally, like this is my kind of go-to workflow for these uh, rather than, I wanted to be more of in the creative mode, sculpture mode uh, for the mesh rather than more of a technical side. So I feel that the, the curve side ends up being a little more technical because you can make an asset and you could use it, um, which would end up working in say the production model um, a lot better, but at this stage, I kind of want to stay in that creative flow and I want to do more sculpting than say um, technical processes. So that's, that's the main reason uh, for me using this process instead of another one. So Max is asking, are your models being tweaked after they're finished or use them technically hand them over? So it would depend on the project. Um, some of the ones that I've done in the uh, past in terms of this kind of technical stuff uh, would end up being, you know, they're just there for its purpose. And the purpose is to get the IP signed off on and established. So if you make something, um, it's, I'm not making the production model. I'm making a, the 3D concept of the concept Scott did so that we have a version of it that is now tangible in 3D. And then after that is signed off on, then it would go into, you know, after the project's greenlit and say, hey, yes, go ahead and do it, the model would probably change again some. Um, if you think about, say, like, um, pretty much anything, like this is just the pitch model, right? So, so it's the one that's gonna sell and make it, but it's not really gonna be the final, final model. So it's the pitch model, not the sell one. And so definitely, uh, you know, I could be the one, you know, in theory that would end up working on this model. If I really enjoyed the project, really enjoyed the IP, oftentimes um, in the development cycle, you can be like, hey, I really want to work on that pitch that we just did. I want to work on that IP. Can I be the, you know, the modeler for that? And oftentimes they'll be like, yeah, go ahead. Um, but then other times, you know, you may want to hand it off because there may be something else uh, you may be more interested in. So it just depends on the uh, scenario. 
and also the size of the company too. So if it's a really kind of small company, you may be doing it all. Uh, if you have more of a larger company, it may come down also to uh, budgetary assets too. And uh, your work on the project may be too expensive for the project's needs. So you then may end up um, having it handed off or outsourced to uh, other companies. And then they would end up working on the production model. Um, and then oftentimes you would send the, you know, the 3D concept and the 2D concepts and kind of all your kind of work files up to this stage off to them, just kind of help them build their final assets. But always, uh, that's not always kind of a viable process either. Sometimes if it is contracted out, they may not, you may not be able to send the um, work models or the ones that were used in a production. So I know for film and stuff, it often comes into play where you know they have a concept model, <laughs> you know they got one, but you just can't get it signed off on to say, make the toy of that concept model. So oftentimes they may end up having to just remake it from images of your concept model rather than anything else. So you can see we're trying to we're starting to flesh out those kind of design elements through there. Now this is basically just a block out in terms of the sense here. So if anything's still looking kind of rough, um, you can definitely all change it. So I may want to you know expand these out a little bit more, maybe get some more of that negative shape in between the tentacles. Um, I kind of like the boxed up version of this a little bit right now though. But then say I may want to come through and say smooth it. And let's just see what it would look like with kind of these striations through there. Um, so I come in and carve in on this kind of surface through here. And I basically just want to make a divot into my mesh here. And then of course, you know, watch that shoulder and watch how it flows you want to make sure that it, it is plausible that's happening. Um, and doing something like this is also increasing that kind of bison grizzly effect that Scott was talking about in his uh, video, because you're getting the slope back, right? And then also, you know, you could do different things at this time here just to kind of play with those forms. And always while you're doing this too, make sure that you're, you know, checking that silhouette. And this is a handy little thing up here because you can quickly see, you know, what's happening. Like this tentacle here, right? You know, I'm, I now have this space between this body. So plausibly, you know, this, this isn't really probably what happened. These may, you know, they're tentacles, so they're gonna go everywhere. So I may want them closer to the chest there. And I'm not liking this kind of aspect of them shooting out. Like I want some more of them kind of coming back in. So checking that kind of stuff as you work is handy too, because then you can kind of correct elements as you go. So I know a lot of people, if you're doing 2D stuff, um, you'd end up using kind of the mirror tool to kind of flip things over and see things at a different angle. So this silhouette mode inside of ZBrush kind of gives a similar kind of process um, because I'm just getting another view of it. Um, oftentimes too, if I'm working on things, um, definitely taking a break, giving your eye a break for a while and coming back is another big thing because basically you don't want to get bogged down into um, things that may not be working. And so coming back with new eyes or even working in tandem, as we're kind of talking about here, uh, sending the model at a certain point over to your, you know, the concept artist, you know, sending it back to Scott and being like, hey, Scott, what do you think of this? And that's the, the kind of the workflow and the pattern that works the best in terms of um, this kind of design process. Because really like getting feedback um, does help in terms of uh, making things better. Another thing that I find interesting too is um, if you ever have say like a, no learning, learning tip. If you ever have things like uh, portfolios or things that you are doing and you know, if you're just starting out, you're trying to get a job, trying to get things like that. Um, don't uh, turn down the uh, kind of idea of crowdsourcing kind of stuff or not crowdsourcing, but getting, I guess, the effect from a lot of people um, onto things. So it's kind of like taking a survey, right? So if you have say like your portfolio, right? And you're trying to build it to get a job and you have like all these characters, right? So you, number one, you don't really want to ask your mom or dad, right? Because they're gonna always just be like, hey, yeah, that sounds great, go with it, it's perfect. But what you can do is uh, take those and just print them out or like, you know, get a digital version of it printed so you have a tangible reference of it. And with these, give them to a group of people and just say, hey, pick the five you like and then put a mark on the back. And so you may have a stack of, you know, all your portfolio pieces in there and they may have like 10 to 20 of these. And then you go through and you hand it to people and they pick their five top. You give them the 10 people, 
you're going to quickly see which ones people think are the highest versus your other ones. And then those become the ones that you should move to your front of your portfolio. Um, so that's like kind of this crowdsourcing element of there's things like you can go with the mass and they're probably going to like something over something else. And even if you put your mom or dad into that kind of cycle there, and they, they're only allowed to pick five, so they can't pick all of them, they're still going to tailor it down to ones they like more than something else. And so you're still going to get a, a good view on their um, kind of feeling for what you have. So definitely, um, if you're doing anything like that, you know, don't, don't forget there are, you can, you know, the more people you hit with something, <laughs> you can definitely get a feeling or approach for it and uh, use it to your advantage um, in terms of things like that. Uh, one thing I do for coloring objects is uh, Adobe has this uh, site called Color. And so oftentimes if I want something to be kind of, um, how do you say it, uh, appealing to people, right? Go find a color palette that people find appealing. And that site is all crowdsourced color variants, right? So people will post a thing of color and then you'll have 3,000 likes for this set of colors. And then you may have another set of colors that's only got 10. If you pick the one with 3,000 likes, you have a higher chance of that art being appealing because you already know that 3,000 people like that color scheme. Um, so there's all sorts of things you can do in terms of that. Um, and just technology's opened a lot of it in terms of the internet where you can you know, use that to your advantage too and make your stuff more uh, delectable. We'll use that word today. So fun, fun stuff there. So for these little kind of striations on the neck stuff through here, um, there's a bunch of different ways I can go about doing this. But basically, I just want to see if it works first. And so instead of setting up some you know, complex uh, stuff or using some different processes, I'm just going to quickly do this, right? This is going to visually tell me instantly this works or it doesn't work. Um, if it's too much, I'll be able to tell. And I didn't spend a lot of time. It took two seconds to kind of see, okay, those striations are working. Um, and if they didn't, then I could just get rid of them. Another thing with inside of uh, ZBrush here, we have the abilities for you know symmetry and things that will speed up your process. And so you can see here, as I was modeling this, um, I kind of missed some areas, or maybe as I was working, I didn't put it, I put it on one side and not on the other. So we can quickly get that back by just with one click. And now I've got you know both sides back to being symmetrical. And I can just flush these out a little bit more just to kind of see there. Another thing with transitions is a big thing in terms of modeling. Um, and that's those light areas, the things that catch the surfaces of your models. And so these can be done you know, easily just in a sculptural format just by taking a brush, like this one's like called the damn standard brush. And it has this kind of spike aspect to it. And when you're doing stuff like cloth or things like that, if you look at your clothing, there's always a seam, right? So the clothing's made with seams. And with the seams, you'll notice that they never like lay flat on top of each other. There's always a bulge or a bump in terms of the edge. And that little bump there catches light, right? And that makes that difference where you can actually see that transition in there. So that's a good example of a transition area. So for things like this, if I don't have that bump, this area looks flat. Right? But if I just add this to it, now I've got a different light source hitting this and it makes that thing pop just a little bit more. And this is one thing that um, you know, you'll do with 2D concepts by adding you know, white or lighter colors to it. Um, but you can do it by 3D too by just bumping an edge. And so a lot of stuff, when I get to more kind of sculptural stuff, just adding that there too, just change that dynamic on that shape. Now I have this light hitting it a little bit differently. It's not giving me this kind of soft, kind of mundane um, kind of surface. Now I have this kind of pop that's happening. And even though it's done quickly and it's a you know quick process on this, it's now fleshing that out and making it a little bit stronger. Now I can see like it's adding that element of kind of this re repetitive uh, style here. So another thing uh, I go to too, so now we're, I like this kind of talking through theory stuff. I have a lot of them, a lot of theories. <laughs> Another thing I'll do when I'm modeling stuff um, for characters is I'll try to use repeating objects or repeating shapes. And this comes down to how things are mass produced and that brings it back to stuff to reality. With say, you know, Rig here, right? So we briefly just to kind of hit on this, if we talk about his, uh, his compression hammer, right? So if a company made the compression hammer, they had all these parts and they probably ordered maybe two types of bolts, right? 
So if you have a bolt on that compression hammer, it should be the same bolt like everywhere else. You shouldn't have all these bolts with different sizes because that is not a plausible scenario. If someone's gonna mass produce something, a weapon, a piece of gear, an equipment, a piece of armor, all that stuff is standardized to the point where a company can go ahead and order 10 of this instead of ordering one of 10 things. Like that's just a huge kind of area in there that could cause chaos. They could not deliver the one part that you need. So then you have this whole like kind of chaos mess on your hand. But if you can isolate stuff down to one part multiple times, it's a lot less inventory um, and a lot less things to manage. So anything in terms of, uh, you know, military gear and equipment too, when you have straps or anything on there, they're probably gonna be the same size straps. At most, you may have three different sizes. You have ones that are usually, you know, the thick ones that would be, you know, say around your belt buckle, maybe around the shoulder pads that would come around the shoulders. And then the smaller, thinner ones would be the ones that would connect too. You're not gonna have a different size strap everywhere. Um, and another thing too that I often see when um, I see people with, you know, military soldiers. Military soldiers is kind of like my, my go-to overall. I grew up playing a lot of uh, G.I. Joe and watching G.I. Joe, and then uh, my game design uh, kind of experience was all in military shooters. And so with that, it, it kind of a stickler over terms of, you know, when characters generate, are generated and they have a pouch on it, right? And the thing that irks me, one of the, the biggest things is if say like, let's say as an example here, let's just take, say this sphere here, and say, let's say I go ahead I take this and I'm just going to uh, make a quick pouch here quick. It's a little bit too much. Come on, pouch. So here we go. We got, we got something like this, right? So it's got this kind of pouch shape. It's coming up. And we'll add, we'll add a little of that line through there. All right, so there you go. Quick pouch. Quick and dirty, not the best, sorry. <laughs> but say he has this on his belt, right? Have you seen the size of this guy's hands? Look at these. What can he pull out of that pouch? It's way too small. And so this is the thing too, to definitely come through and you know think about as you're designing stuff too, is think about the usage of it, right? Like this pouch may be cool. It may be generating this really cool you know, silhouette, like it's definitely like, that's, that's a cool silhouette that's happening here, right? But this pouch itself, how is he gonna use this? <laughs> like his thumb is as big as this pouch. So how is he gonna go in there? Like say he has something in there, he needs to get it out. He opens the lid and he goes to reach in and he can't fit two fingers in it, it's not gonna work. So that's the other aspect of terms of, you know, just plausible stuff as you're sculpting things. Now you could say that, hey, if, if these things may make more sense if they're up here, right? So let's say I take these and he's got pouches on his shoulders, right? Okay, you're saying, well, they're, they're still too small, but they're not for him now. They're for Rick. They're for his little buddy. He's got pouches on his shoulders for his little friend. Then that makes sense, right? So then his little friend can go in there and open up the pouch and get what he needs to go, and they're his size pouches. So just changing, you know, if you like a design, you know, just make sure it kind of works <laughs> is the other thing because it's going to add more believable, more realism to it and people aren't going to question it. Um, they're not going to be like, oh, well, what's, what, why is that pouch so small? So little, little knowledge there. So I've only got a few more minutes for today. So um, I'm going to go through and show you guys kind of, this is roughly where I was hoping to be in the stream. So I just want to show you the initial kind of building processes of this. And this kind of process continues for the entire kind of block out. Uh, session here and it's basically just manipulating forms quickly and moving around and thinking about those design elements So I'm not going into a lot of detail at this stage. I'm not going into a lot of um, You know coloring or anything like that I'm just focusing on forms focusing on silhouette and this goes back and reflects kind of what Scott was doing in terms of his Conceptual artwork so focus on those forms focus on the silhouette and then the next time after that's done Then you come back in and you start flushing out more details now, with through here, um, I have a, you know, just another kind of version of this. So oftentimes when I'll do stuff too, I definitely will go through and sculpt uh, multiple kind of things just to make sure stuff's working, right? So 
I try to go through quick and block out different shapes. I do a bunch of variants oftentimes too to see, hey, does this work, does this not work? Um, Cause that will save you a lot of time too, just doing it quickly. If you find out is garbage in that quick turn, um, just get rid of it. Um, if it works, it's gonna work. If it doesn't, it doesn't. So don't spend a lot of time, you know, focusing on different elements on or zooming in in something that's uh, not fully fleshed out yet in hopes that it'll get better. You can notice pretty quickly if it's gonna go bad <laughs> right out the gate. And so a lot of times, you know, I will not massage stuff. I try to do it quick and dirty because um, if it's right, it's right. If it's not gonna be right, you're gonna notice it quick. So this was another kind of block out version of the uh, mesh here just to make sure stuff's gonna flow and work. Um, I was messing with some of the armor stuff through here. So that's another element that I want to kind of hinder and play with is the armor of this character. So we talked earlier about the surface of that pressure. So I want to make sure this armor can withstand that pressure and then finding out a way um, to mimic different design elements. Now Scott, when he was doing his initial things, he talked about well, this triangle shape, this kind of bison effect. And so we can also use those in the rest of the design to kind of play off of, right? So what if the armor has these kind of triangle shapes into it, right? That also adds to this triangle body tone. Um, same with say designs on the cloth when I get to that aspect of it. You know, keeping things with that same shape mimics it. It enhances the form because now it's repeated, right? So I have triangle patterns that are maybe in the weave of the cloth. We have triangle shaped armor and then we have our character that has that triangle build, right? That sh sloping of the shoulders. Um, so that's definitely all comes into play. You can also, you know, you get the triangle point horns, you got the triangle thing, and it's just those kind of things, keeping that repetitive nature just hones in on that design and locks it in. Oh, so that might, that is close to it for this thing. Um, I see, thank you Daisuke and uh, Predrag for coming through and uh, answering questions in here. So we got a question about building big pieces of armor or clothes. So oftentimes at this stage, just for the conceptual 3D model, I'll do the same kind of process I did here. Um, and as you can see like this through here, this is just sculpted, right? So all I was doing was doing that same thing. Um, I'll come through and build up, say a shape. Let me turn off my sculptures here. And then if I want this to be harsh, uh, we have a few brushes inside ZBrush that will kind of enhance this. My main go-to is uh, H-Polish. And this will allow you to come through and you can kind of polish the surface and get a hard edge to it. So all these through here are just quickly done like this, like just coming through and hitting these edges. And if you hit it at the right angle, it's gonna polish that out. There's also an alternate one of this where I can come through and build it back up and then I can hit it again and it's this kind of edge bumping is what I end up doing on a lot of these kind of shapes to get through here. Now, is this the most efficient way to kind of sculpt hard surface edges? No. <laughs> you could definitely go through and use the Z Modeler brush. Um, I could retopologize this. Um, it just depends on what your strengths are. If you're faster at doing it this way, um, definitely by all means, uh, do it this way. If you're faster at the other ways, uh, do it there. So it really just depends on what you're doing here. And then for this one here, I knew it was gonna I didn't want to spend the time going in and making it perfect if it wasn't going to work. So I'm just testing out these shapes and testing out these forms. And if it doesn't work, then I get rid of it. And then if later on, if I decide, hey, I like this way this is going, but these are still, you know, like this area through here is a little bit lumpy, right? So I'd go back in and fix that. Um, I could fix it using the move brush, or I could go back and just generate this outer form and then extrude off of that to get that entire shape. So it just depends. Um, on where it's going with it. But oftentimes at this stage, I'm, I wanna make sure stuff's working uh, before I go on to it. Uh, I use, I switch back and forth. So we have a question, do I use a tablet or a mouse? I switch back and forth. Uh, you may hear me clicking over here. So I do have a, a tablet here. Um, at home on my um, desktop, I have a Cintiq. But I will do any sort of, um, most of the times I will use the mouse, I'll switch to it. And this is just a habit from using uh, Max and Maya for years, anytime I go into like a poly polygonal modeling mode. So if I switch to that Z modeler brush, automatically my brain kicks in and I usually go and grab the mouse. Not all the times, but it's a high possibility that if I'm doing anything in the Z modeler world, uh, using that brush to generate topology and low res pieces of geometry, I will have the mouse in hand rather than stylus. So Dougie's asking about a ball joint. Uh, I may have that somewhere, I have to find it. It was, I had it uploaded a while, I think I had it linked on ZBrush Central, which is our community hub uh, for all things ZBrush. And I think I had it uploaded there. Um, I'd say check that, just check my posts for that. I think I included it 
when we did the Boolean features and uh, released that version. And I think there's a link in that post that will take you to that Boolean file and then you can use that. So one more quick thing here. I wanna go in and just hit up on the stream stuff here. So let's go back to my... So this was the uh, first of three streams for the Pixelogic and Proco collaboration. So we teamed up with Scott Flanders over at Proco and he has done a video that kind of goes through the process of this. I will be coming back on Wednesday the 13th to continue this process here. I'll have some of this model more fleshed out. So this was just the first of it in the initial kind of conceptual stage, how we're working in collaboration, and also how I kind of think about things as I'm modeling and designing inside of ZBrush. Wednesday, May 8th, or May 13th will be the next one here, and we'll come back and hit some more on this. Uh, for now, if you guys have not watched Scott Flanders' video, definitely uh, click this link here. I'll also put it in the chat quick. And uh, with this, definitely check out his video there. Um, it's excellent, and it's gonna take you right to Proko's uh, YouTube channel here. And you can watch Scott doing the initial stages where he gets to this concept art. If you guys are just tuning in and have not touched ZBrush ever in your life, uh, we have a trial, and this is a 30-day uh, full-featured trial that you can use for 30 days. You're gonna get the same experience I had today. This is what I'm using here. I'm using basically the trial version of ZBrush. This is all just standard default ZBrush here, so if you load it up, you're gonna see something similar to what I'm doing here. Um, I didn't load anything custom into the ZBrush. You can definitely customize ZBrush if you want, but for all my streams, I use the vanilla version, so you're able to you know, download the trial and mess with the things that I was talking about in this stream. Now, in addition to the trial, uh, ZBrush has multiple ways to get into it. Uh, we have uh, monthly subscriptions, and then we also have perpetual licenses. Now, for the perpetual licenses on this, I have been using ZBrush for a long, long time now. And I bought ZBrush when it was like $250. And I've never had to pay for an upgrade. Um, and there's no yearly subscription fees. And this was well before I even joined Pixelogic as a uh, developer. And we never charge for upgrades. So you buy the software once and I've had it for life. <laughs> so it's been a huge uh, turning point in terms of my artistic career as well. So when I started out making games, I was doing edge turning and vertex pulling. And I don't know how long I would have lasted um, in that kind of realm because it was very, very tedious and it, it just wasn't, it was fine and exciting at the time, but it wasn't as creative as I wanted to be. And then I had a friend show me ZBrush and then instantly that was it, I was hooked. And then it just opened up everything. Like I could now take what I could envision in my mind and fully flesh it out quickly just by sculpting. And it was just so freeing going to this, room, uh, this realm of, say, you know, digital manipulation in terms of sculpting rather than going in and pushing and pulling tightening vertices and turning edges and doing that kind of process. So it definitely changed my entire workflow and made my career in life a lot happier. Um, in addition to the professional version of ZBrush, we also have ZBrush Core. Now, ZBrush Core is our light version of ZBrush. We have some of our streamers, if you've been following this little thing that's right here, um, you'll see that uh, Daisuke's name will come up and also Solomon Blair. Uh, they've been doing some streams for our development streams uh, on ZBrush Core, so you can go see what that's like. ZBrush Core is our light version. It comes in at a very lower price compared to the professional one because it doesn't contain everything the professional has, but it's still very powerful. And in Japan, a lot of uh, some of the great toys and stuff that come out of there uh, and collectibles end up are using Z ZBrush Core rather than professional version. So it's another powerful piece of software and you can get into that as low as $10 a month. Uh, finally, if you're interested in learning more about ZBrush, we have a whole site on our uh, website, which is pixelogic.com called Z Classroom. In here, there's a bunch of free training. So all our training here on Z Classroom is free. You can come through here and click on these and uh, check those out. And this covers a lot of the basic stuff uh, and even some more of the advanced features in there. There's one set of videos that I've done that will cover every single process of the Z Modeler Brush. So if you have any questions on any of the Normally of Z Modeler Brush, which contains you know the edge extrusions, the kind of the ZBrush poly modeling workflow. Uh, there's a video that covers on every single one of processes of those. Addition to other learning attributes, if you ever have any kind of questions for ZBrush or how to do things, um, you can do a search for Ask ZBrush on YouTube, and there's might be a video that contains to that process. There's almost uh, 500 videos now, I think 500, um, on this kind of format here. These are short videos. Maybe uh, they're usually. Uh, 
anywhere from uh, five to 10 minutes and they'll go through the process and kind of walk you through it. Like, well, how can I do this? Well, here's the steps, right? So you can follow along and do that. Finally, uh, we have uh, Zebra Central and Zebra Central is our community hub. And if you are an artist and let me spell it right. Let's work on that spelling. I'm an artist, not a speller, Jim. In here we have our community hub and we can see a lot of works in here. And so this is where our users will come and post their images. And so there's a ton of whole bunch of excellent artwork up here. You can also comment and communicate with these guys as well. Our community is huge and they're often really open on adding tips and techniques and how to do certain things. As you can see here in the stream, there's a lot of um, people in here that have been just helping out and they're just, they're not with us in terms of Pixelogic as a company, but they're helping us out in the ZBrush community. So I want to thank you guys that have helped out and answered questions in this stream as well. So Dougie, I will attempt to find that ball joint for you. Um, and I will see if I can find that and next stream show up and I should have a ball joint link for you. So it should be there. I'm pretty sure I uploaded it. So thank you all for coming out and watching this. Make sure you guys check out the next ones here. And so if we, I'll put the link to these calendar pages as well. Let me just do that click. And definitely check out Proko's uh, video up on his YouTube channel there for Scott. And then we look forward to seeing you guys out at the next streams as well, where we'll be flushing out this design a little bit more. Uh, coming up next will be Paul on Saturday. So if you want to get into and watch more of ZBrush in action, Paul will be going. He's been working on a little gremlin character and he walks through a lot of stuff too. So he's one of my co-developers. Um, definitely check out his stream as well. And you can see he's going on 12 p.m. on Saturday. So have a good weekend and stay safe. And... Uh, Get some ZBrushing in while you can. It's time to do it. Free trial. Go download it. And thank you all. And thanks, Daisuke, for questions. Appreciate it. Happy ZBrushing, you guys. Take care.